Hello and welcome to the Moving Past You Radio Show. I am your host, Juanita Gaynor, and I definitely want to welcome you to tonight's show. Um, Today we are going to talk about the power of words. You know, Jesus spoke plainly about our idle words. You know, sometimes his warning often goes unheeded. Jesus said that for every idle word, there will be a time of accounting in the day of judgment. We would expect Jesus to condemn profane and vile uses of the tongue, but idle words? Idle words are things we say carelessly, without concern, or for the impact on others. You know, we're too quickly to assume that the sins of our tongue are minor sins, sins that God will overlook. Yet Jesus was fully aware of the devastating nature of our words. Now, before we go ahead and deep dive into this evening's topic, let us open up in a word of prayer. You know, dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are a loving and gracious God and thank you that you've offered us forgiveness and the gift of new life in you. We want to thank you that you're perfect perfect self that your love is perfect and it never fails and that nothing can separate us from your love we pray that our lives would be filled and overflowing with the power of your love so that we can make a difference in this world and bring honor to you we ask for your help in reminding us that the most important things are not what we do outwardly it's not based on any talent or gift But the most significant thing we can do in life is simply to love you and choose to love others. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. So welcome to August the 1st. You know, it's amazing that we are just, we're past the halfway mark for 2019. And before you know it, the holidays are going to be here and we're going to be heading into a new year. And so I know there's plenty of times we've discussed about the power of the tongue, the power of words, you know, what we say, the importance of it. And I know I've done many series on it. I've done, you know, studies and devotionals on it. But it's something that God keeps bringing to the forefront. And so therefore, we have to continue to realize and identify and recognize the things that he is bringing to our attention. And so tonight we have three pivotal scriptures and there'll be scriptures throughout. Um, I'll definitely say what they are. Um, the first three are based in the New Living Translation version and I will read those. And our basis scripture for the entire lesson this evening is James, the third chapter, the first through the 18th verse. Um, I'll be coming from the King James Version and the New Living Translation based on as needed. Um, also, Proverbs eighteen twenty one, the power, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. And then we have Ephesians 4 and 29. And it says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And the final scripture that I'll be reading in the beginning is Hebrews 5 and 7. And it said, while Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. You know, now I have, you know, a big confession. I know when we think about what we say and how we say it, we don't realize that our mouth, our tongues can literally kill people. And you may say, well, I haven't physically killed anybody. I've never murdered anybody. Yes, but if you've spoken against them with your tongue, you have killed them. You have destroyed their spirit. And without their spirit within them, you've killed them. They're a shell of themselves. So we really do have to be careful of what we say. You know, and don't use the, oh, well, I didn't say it, but you thought it and it's just as damaging. So we really have to work on our relationship with Christ so that we are cognizant of what we're thinking, what we're saying and what we're putting in the atmosphere. 
you know, because you got our words are very powerful. You know, apart from the redeeming work of Christ, <clears throat> we will only do harm with our words. You know, we need wisdom from above on how to use our words wisely. <clears throat> our words also reveal the state of our heart. The Bible stresses that what you say is an accurate indication of what is in your heart. If your words bless and encourage others, they give evidence of a compassionate heart. If you share the good news about Christ, you demonstrate a heart that is grateful for your own salvation. When others are in crisis, do they know they will find peace and comfort in your words? You know, do you frequently and spontaneously office prayer for others? You know, do your words and the manner in which you say them reveal a patient heart? All of these behaviors indicate a heart that is like the heart of the follower. You know, transparency moment. I have not always been there. Because of my own trials, because of my own tribulations and things that I've gone through, particularly in my life, I really wasn't always there. You know, I may say that I'm thinking for you or praying for you or hoping the best for you, but I didn't say anything negative, but I had my own issues and my own problems. So I was just using it as lip service. It wasn't coming genuinely from the heart at that point in time. However, once I began to go through my journey of healing, I realized that compassion for others became easy. And so many of you may be listen, you know, listening right now. Or who may listen on, you know, the replays coming down the pike, you may say, well, I, I don't know how to do that. And the thing would be is it's like in order to get to a place of loving others and having a heart for the father, you have to allow the father to work on you. You have to allow him to dig in and get the root of what is going on in your life so that you can be a productive and loving human being. And so we also do we have to understand and I'm not I'm gonna probably stress this a lot throughout this evening is that our words have tremendous, tremendous power. As the Bible says, life and death are in the power of the tongue. You know, I really do believe our prayers will have more power and greater anointing, you know, when our every day life is filled with words that uplift and bring grace to others you know a holy life is a powerful life when it comes to seeing answers to prayers jesus's prayers were heard because of his reverent submission righteous living and righteous speech come right you know come from a right heart before god you know when you think about the words and the things that we speak we can speak many words in a minute and several thousand in an hour. Can you imagine how many words the average, the average person speaks in a day? And some, you can based on some estimates, you know, are that women speak twice as many words as a day as men. I can be honest, we do. You know, there are certain situations I've definitely learned how to get to the point Rain in my words, but we do speak more words a day than men. Sorry, ladies, but that is a fact. <laughs> okay. Because basically, you know, we could field a library in a lifetime, you know, with the words and the things that we speak. Now, if we did, what would the title of those books be? I really want you to think about it. If you're was going to build, it was going to build a library and it was going to be based on your words. What would those books be? See, our tongue, it has a powerful influence on others. And God is looking for a holy life. And the one of the key areas that we must guard with all diligence is our tongue. You know, the truth is we all have problems with what we say. I'm going to say that again. We all have problems with what we say. No one is exempt from this. And that is why the Bible plays so much emphasis and in instruction and language regarding the tongue. 
You know, Proverbs is filled with verses about the positive and negative aspects of the tongue. If you was to count the terms tongue, lips, mouth, and words that come, how many times it comes up in the Bible, they appear over 170 times. You know, James 3, 4 and 5, and it's the New Living Translation, it says a small rudder makes a huge ship turn whenever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire so when you think of that analogy when you think of boats you know they're huge ships they're huge however you know they are controlled and steered by the captain and he has taken time and energy to study the patterns and know when to go where to go how to go The same for our tongue. It is a tiny little part of our body, but it is powerful. And the wrong thing can spark somebody into a rage. It can cut somebody. It can hurt their feelings. So we have to know how to guard it accordingly. You know, because see, speaking negatively is very costly in the spiritual realm. You know, well, when we watch, we, you know, what we say, it definitely can bring a reward in the spiritual realm. You know, if we look back to the days in Jericho, God's people marched around the city in silence for six days. When they finally shouted on the seventh day, the walls came down immediately. Their silence and then shouting at the right time won them victory. And when we look at this, you have to understand that it is true for us on an individual basis as well. You know, if we guard our speech, we can have great victory. Just some things I want us to think about, you know, when we walk and speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, we definitely will defeat the enemy. Um, Also, when we abide in Christ, his spirit flows from our lives in word and in deed everywhere we go. Because at that point, because he's abiding with us, our ways are his ways, our thoughts are his thoughts, our wants are his wants. You know, when whenever we enter a place where fear It's evident we can come in the spirit of peace and we can speak words of life. You know, that is what can happen when we guard our speech. You know, our words can be kind and full of love. You know, our actions along with the words that are spoken with gentleness and peace and self-control demonstrate love even in the midst of our enemies. In Galatians 5, you know, 22 to 23, King James Version says it clearly. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against there's no such law. And so when we talk about the tongue, the lips, what we say, um, Proverbs 10, the entire, all of Proverbs 10, it has seven characteristics of the lips of righteousness. You know, when we are refrained from critical and negative speech, we must replace it with uplifting, positive, grace-filled words. I want you to think about the words you speak. Are they uplifting and do they bring life to others? I want you to ask God to help you evaluate your speech as you read these verses. And I definitely want you to really deep dive into Proverbs 10. But I'm going to go over these seven characteristics. And with those, I'll tell you the various verses that are attached to them. 
The first one is fountain of life. The mouth of righteousness is a fountain of life, but violence overwhelms the mouth of the wicked. And that is verse 11. In verse 13, the second one is discerning lips. It says wisdom is found on the lips of the discerning, but a rod is for the back of him who lacks judgment. And key when we're talking about holding, you know, the tongue. It says hold his tongue. That's verse 19. And it says when words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. And I'm going to expound upon that a little bit. I think back to something that my grandmother used to say many times. She said, if you don't have anything nice and uplifting to say, don't say anything at all. And me being a, a child, a rambunctious child, and I like to tell you what I thought, when I thought, how I thought. And sometimes when I would tell or say something or speak it, I would be upset because I really didn't get the reaction or what I was looking for overall when it came to, you know, saying what I needed to say. And so I remember when I really began to put what my grandmother said into practice. Um, and I'll be honest, I'll be 45 in December. So this is maybe just in the last 15 years that I begin to do this. And when I would do this, you know, just be like, okay, Juanita, you don't have nothing nice to say. So just, just don't say nothing at all. I found out that it was more powerful. I found out that it was a different reaction because now I'm not just opening my mouth and speaking on stuff just because I can't. I am preserving it for the proper time when you know the words are going to be most impactful and matter and so therefore I'm not giving myself an opening or an opportunity for someone to come back and challenge my words or to say that I was not you know open and honest and loving when I said what I had to say so please learn how to hold your tongue because everything does not warrant a response and so we've covered fountain of life, discerning lips and hold his tongue. Number four, coming from verse 20, choice silver. The tongue of righteousness is choice silver, but the heart of wicked is of little value. Meaning your tongue choosing to be righteous, choosing to hold your tongue is valuable. You know, the lips of the righteous, number five, nourishes many. And that's coming from verse 21. And it says, the lips of the righteous nourish many, but fools die for lack of judgment. And because it nourishes many, meaning that because you learned how to discern, know how to, you know, speak life into people back up when you can't say anything, it brings more. You know, have you ever heard that term? You can, you know... You can attract more um, flies with honey than vinegar. So therefore, you can being, you know, righteous in what you say can bring people to you. Now, holding your tongue and knowing what and when to say does not mean you are condoning wrong. There's many times that we observe, we see, we acknowledge, we see what's going on. But see, we have to be discerning to when God tells us to speak. Because if we speak inappropriately at the wrong time with the wrong term, tone, we cause more damage. We don't get the job done. And therefore, God's will isn't done. So we have to, again, know when to speak. Number six, which comes out of verse 31, and it brings, it said, brings forth wisdom. You know, the mouth of the righteous bring forth wisdom, but a perverse tongue will be cut out. Basically, you keep running off with your mouth. Somebody's going to see you, as we would say back in the day, somebody's going to see you about it. 
So therefore, you never want anybody to see you about it. And I'm going to be honest, I never want God to check me on something that I knew I shouldn't have said or I didn't have the wisdom to say or because I was out of anger or whatever or I was trying to get my point across. He has to correct me for being out of order. So know that righteous lips and tongues bring forth wisdom. And the final attribute and description characteristics that Proverbs 10 provides regarding the lips of righteousness. And it comes from verse 32. Knows what is fitting. The lips of righteousness know what is fitting, but the mouth of the wicked only what is perverse. Basically, when you have followed, when you're following Christ and you are listening to him and you are, you know, seeking him and guiding him, what happens is, is that you know what to say and when to say it. You do know what to say, when to say it. And so what you don't want to do is get yourself to a point where you just are just speaking. You are just speaking. And that is the thing, you know, because again, time and again, time and time again, the scriptures are just addressing the tongue. And just like we have Proverbs 10 that gives us the seven characteristics of the lips of righteousness, righteousness, James devoted an entire chapter to controlling your tongue. And again, again, that is James 3. He did an entire chapter on it because it is so powerful. See, the tongue is given such extensive treatment. How we handle the tongue, again, is a great indicator of our hearts. So I am going to like, we're going to to go back to um, Aesop. And it's basically a fable to share just a valid point. Basically, you know, a donkey found a lion's skin. He tried it on, strutted around, and frightened many animals. Soon, a fox came along, and the donkey tried to scare him too. But the fox, hearing the donkey's voice, said, If you want to terrify me, You'll have to disguise your bray. You know, Aesop's moral is clothes may disguise a fool, but his words will give him away. Our words will give us away. Like I said, in James 3, 1 through 18, we see that the tongue has power and that is by nature hypocritical. And it can be transformed only only transformed from God above. And when I mean it has to be transformed above, we have to truly think about, you know, our relationship with God. Like we can't just be like, okay, we're just going to do it and we're we're going to be okay. We have to have a strong connection, a strong relationship with him. And again, be building that relationship, seeking him, allowing him to do the work within us so that therefore we can be fully transformed. You know, again, we're going back to understanding the power of the tongue. We must know it. Um, And James 3, 1 through 8, you know, really dives into what that is. I'm just going to really pull up and I'm going to read um, a couple of the verses. Um, I'm trying to think. We're going to do the King James Version. It says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing what we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and is able to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us and turn about their whole body. But also ships were thought to be great and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whatsoever the governor listeth. 
Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. The tongue and the tongue is a fire, the world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body and setteth on fire the course of nature and it sets on fire of hell. For every kinds of beasts and birds and of the serpents and of the things of the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue no man tame. It is unruly evil, full of deadly poison. So we can't, you know, do this, you know, on our own. See, most people, the problem is most people want to be heard. You know, now, what a better way to be heard as a believer than to be a teacher of the gospel. But yet James urges us to consider the power of the tongue. You know, we must not be hasty in propelling ourselves into a position where the tongue is constantly used. It is powerful and will incur a stricter judgment. And that is so true. When I started my show, when I started doing devotionals, you know, more and more people began to tune in to the things that I was saying, what I was doing, how I was moving. And at the end of the day, you know, I decided that I am doing what God's told me to do. I am being in order. I am praying before I do things. So I did not have any fear of how I was moving. But I did understand that my voice, my lips, my tongue was powerful and people, it will draw or repel people. And I am looking to draw people to the word of God. So I understood that, yes, it was going to be a stricter judgment. So therefore, I know that as I'm doing this show, as I do devotion, as I speak, I am going to be held to a stricter judgment. I am going to be held to stricter scrutiny. However, I am perfectly okay with that because I know that my relationship with God, I know that I seek him in everything. I know that, you know, he is working on me to make sure that I don't say something that is going to deter someone else. And that is also key. You know, I am not perfect. None of us will be perfect while we're on this earth. So please don't let anybody tell you that. But I am choosing not to just do stuff because I have free will and because it's human nature. And oh, we're just going to just do it anyways. I am rebuking that. You know, because if you control your tongue, you can control yourself. You know, James argues from a greater to a lesser in verse two. If one can control their tongue, then they'll be able to control the rest of their body as well. And it's absolutely true. You know, how many times have you said, oh, my God, I'm so sick. Oh, my God, I'm sick as a dog. I don't feel too well. I'm miserable. And that's what happened. That's that was your entire day. You were miserable. You were sick as a dog. You know, you didn't, you know, was had an attitude because you opened your mouth and you put those things on yourself. And no, I'm not going to, I'm not coming at you because I've done it too. Matter of fact, I probably did it this week. But, you know, we do that. We do that. So when we're able to control our tongue, we are able to control the things that, you know, we do in our body. And he clearly illustrates that in verse three, when he is discussing the horse and in verse four, when he's talking about the ships. And so we want to understand too, that big things come from the tiny tongue. Um, he illustrates um, in the scripture in verse five, by the wildfire, you know, we have to also know that words can build or destroy. Better than anything else, the tongue displays the state of our heart. We cannot control our tongue on our own. I am going to say it again. We cannot control our heart, our tongue, ourselves. You know, if James left us here, we would be, you know, basically 
in a miserable state. Like if he really didn't like we really read, I really want you to read James three because it really does go into great detail. Um, and definitely compare the different versions so that you can get a greater understanding, but it goes into a lot of detail regarding, you know, the hypocrisy of the time. And that brings us into the second aspect of that. His scripture is that we have to know the hypocrisy of the tongue. See, our tongue can be used for great evil or it can use for great good. Apart from it, you know, apart from redemption, it will just tear down and destroy. Perhaps anything else, the tongue reveals the already but not yet, you know, of the Christian sanctification. The tongue can worship a curse. You know, and the hypocrisy should not be the case. See, James is basically saying in the um, third chapter is that there are unbelievers because their hypocrisy. Um, basically, you can't, <laughs> your mouth, your mouth, your mouth, you have to be careful with that. I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. And verse 9, it says, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which made after the simple similitude of God. And verse 10 says, Out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing, my brethren. These things ought not be so. Okay? We have to watch what we say. We can't straddle the fence. We can't be, what we're going to do? How is this going to work? What's the thing? No, you can't do it. We cannot do it at all. We have to understand that our words carry so much power. So much power that we have to guard that tongue. We have to wrap it up. And know that we just can't let it be out there all willy nilly. You know, we also must know the source of the tongue's redemption. Wow. You know, see, redeemed speech only comes from godly wisdom being imparted on us. Worldly wisdom will lead, you know, to a tongue to us being infused with bitterness and it'll show itself through bragging and denial and just acting like you all that. See, godly wisdom will lead to pure and peaceable speech. It shows itself, you know, worldly wisdom shows itself in bitter envy and selfish ambition. And basically that's always accomplished by bragging. Um, It leads to disorder and every kind of evil. And basically this type of wisdom and speech is our default position. I want you to understand that the type of speech that I'm speaking of, the bragging and the denial and to be in all of that, that is our default position. And that is basically when we think about, when we go back to Genesis 3, when the fall happened. This was, you know, this is our life after the fall. And, you know, Even though Jesus has come and died on the cross to redeem us, we have to choose that life because he gives us free will. So in our innate, intimate human state, the worldly wisdom is our default position. And see, godly wisdom comes from him. It's characterized by pure and peace. It leads to peace. It's the type of wisdom that only comes from God's redeeming grace. You know, the type of wisdom and speech that governs our lives display the work of God in our hearts. You know, where our speech and wisdom is worldly, we see that the earthly, unspiritual, and demonic is the government and authority. And when our speech and wisdom is characterized by the purity and peace we see in something from above, um, it's taken root in our lives and it's spreading throughout our lives. You know, we just know we speak words so recklessly and carelessly and it carries a lot of weight. I mean, 
you think about it, you think about the news, there's not hardly a week that goes by in which you don't read or hear about some celebrity, elected official, or admired athlete whose words have gotten them in hot water. But see, all people think about is what they see on TV. You know, it goes so much deeper than being politically correct. See, the power of our words is fundamental to life and it's instrumental in causing things to die. That's what I said. It's instrumental in causing things to die or live. Everything that exists came about by words. And it's an amazing truth. Everything, everything that exists came about by words. You know, if we think about, if we go back again to Genesis chapter one, um, it's, we'll read that God spoke and all things came into being. God said, and it was so. God called and it was good, then blessed. It is the verbal activity of the almighty God that literally decrees our world existence. You know, and even more remarkable, the one, you know, one of those words were so awesome, you know, gave you and me the same capacity. You know, again, remember, he didn't speak us into existence. He formed us in our image and breathed the breath of life into us. So because he did that, because he made us in his image, we have the same ability with our words. See, because we have the same capacity that the words we speak would be creative, dynamic, and deterministic in the world around us, God, you know, declared that humankind be made in his image and according to his likeness, you know, and we can see that there are three ways by our will, by our words, and our eternal future. Basically, first and foremost, God gave us a tremendous capacity of will. No matter how weak your will may be, it is still as decisive as God's. God makes a decision. It stands. You make a decision. It stands. Let me break that down just a little bit. Because I probably lost a couple of you right, right there. Just right, right there. You're like, how is it that I make a decision and it stands? I don't understand. When you decide... To get something out of his will and you want to keep it, you stay out of his will to keep it. When you decide to take what's less than after God then told you who you are, what you are and what he needed you to do and you decided to do it on your own, your action stands. Whatever we decide to do, good, bad or indifferent, it is our decision and it stands. You know, God's good will towards us never falters, but given free will and unaware of our redemptive role on this earth, we make casual, even rebellious choices as well as off the cuff remarks, which brings me to this. We have the power of words. God, when God speaks, it is so The Bible says that no word that you or I speak is without significance. And I want you to reference 1 Corinthians 14, 10. You know, our words count big time. And that might be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on the words we choose. Okay, again, God has made us in his image and that we are eternal things. The difference is that while God is infinitely past as well as infinitely future, you and I had a beginning point. From the conception in our mother's womb, we begin and ever we shall be. Along with the eternal future comes this capacity to choose by our will and to decree by our words. And our words, like God's, can do the same thing. They can edify, identify, and multiply. 
The word edify is used in the Bible to describe anything that builds up. We go back to Genesis when God speaks, things come into existence. As you and I take in the word of God, we are edified. The spiritual structure of our being is built up and strengthened. What was non-existent in us by reason of our death and sin is now brought to life in Jesus and he builds on that. What was broken down by our past, Jesus has rebuilt it. And this building and rebuilding process is edified by the word of God. You know, and there are also words that the Lord gives us to speak to one another, words by which we edify one another. Like for me and what I do, it's not only teaching to build people, um, but it's also the way I speak to my friends and my family and loved ones. And I hope to build them up. You know, edification also has to do with what we cultivate in one another. It is not difficult to see the difference between people who are nurtured with words of correction, balance, love, or those who were belittled when they were children. When whatever was built in us, be it beautiful or distorted, it is directly related to the power of our words. Let's talk about identification. For the thing God made, he gave identification. Identification is not in terms of what you and I observe, but rather the way we were designated. For example, bondage in life is often a result the way human words identify a person and how that person reacted to them. If the word said you are a parent, sibling, teacher, or friend. We're lovely. You know, they may be giving you a sense of self-worth or cause to become vain, you know, thinking too much. If the words are, you know, depreciating, you may have grown up feeling inadequate or defiant to prove them wrong. And the power of words to identify is awesome. And sometimes it's frightening. And I'm just going to give you an illustration. Like I know when I think about my life and think about my mom and how I came up, I was always identified as Viola's daughter. And I have a series on that. And But I always used to see the negative. And it because with my mom being bad tempered, um, an addict, um, very abusive physically and in her words, I didn't see any good in being considered her daughter. And so therefore, I carried that over to myself in life. And so I was very angry with people, angry with the world, angry with myself. Because I didn't know any other way. And so once that happened and once that kind of went down and as I began to grow and as I began to work on my own healing, I began to see that, you know what, I completely ignored the what God had placed in her that he had placed in me. I was so tuned into what other people had put regarding her character onto me, what I had experienced regarding her character onto me, that there was no way for me to see what God had put on her. So because of the words of others and the, even the words of herself and even my own words, she had already been condemned. So therefore I took it as condemnation as well. So even in that situation, being a child of God and I, you know, being with him and having a strong relationship with him and allowing him to do the work within me, he has changed that identification. And he's shown me that those were circumstances or situationships of her, but that is not who she was in me. So God, even though you grew up in crazy circumstances or bad situations, that is not, that doesn't define, that may define your 
path, your walk. It may help your testimony, but it doesn't define who you are and whose you are in the kingdom. And let's think about, talk about implication. You know, sitting with a man who was sitting with someone who was describing a serious problem that he was having with business. Um, it was a good guy. You know, he talked about the problems, frustration, and he said, you know, well, this damned thing. And he went on to talk for several more minutes and he used the expression a few times. And when he got done, I said, you know, I'm not, you know, that kind of old school, old fashioned things. And you really haven't offended me. You have not offended me, but I want you to understand that you was talking about an issue regarding your business. And for most of all, I'm an accountant. So I listen to business, you know, owners all the time, but I'm also a believer. I'm also a Christian. So I have to, you know, speak on it. And I said, do you realize that in talking about this problem that you're having, you refer to it three times as damned. And you know, when he was like, what what does that mean like why he didn't get it and then when he thought about it he was gonna he's like you know he thought he offended me and he wanted to apologize and I stopped him and I said it's not you know a matter of being offense I said but I want you I want to tell you why you're having this problem I said because you've already cursed it it's your speech you've already made up in your mind that it's a problem and you've cursed it and because you're cursing it, you are causing the damnation of it and you're not invoking the blessing of God. You know, l- more bondage in our lives than what we know is related to the way we talk. You know, we don't speak it into being, but when it becomes comes to us as a direct assault, we accept it and affirm its presence by our words. You know, as the man did when we damn the frustration of it rather than invoke God's blessing on it. And we do that even in our everyday lives. We just be like, oh, this is going to be a miserable day. Oh, this is going to be awful. Oh, this. And so therefore it happens. So we have to have to be really, really careful about our words. Which brings us to multiplication. God blessing. Um, The Bible said God blessed and everything he blesses multiplies. What is the characteristic of him? It multiplies life. That is what you and I are called to do. Edify, identify and multiply in the way that God does. To identify things not only for what they truly are, but for what they can become. Um, God has endowed us with the power to give life by two means, biologically and verbally. We must be able to understand both, but we are called to accountability for the power of our mouths to produce death or life. We have to be accountable to that for producing death or life. Matthew 12, 36 through 37 reads, and I'm reading the King James Version. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and thy words thou shalt be condemned. He tells us that in the day of judgment that we will have to stand before God and give an account for the words we've spoken. Unless those words have been brought under the blood of Jesus Christ, the one power that can disintegrate their bondage. As we do that, God forgives us and then we can stand without record of our words or deeds anymore. 
See, the day of judgment is not only a day in which it's a punishment for evil, but it's also a judgment conveys the ideas of corresponding like liberation as judgment breaks the yokes of sins and bondage. There comes deliverance and release of God's freedom. So there's a very practical way for me and you to apply that. You see, the potency of godly words can revive, heal, change our lives. You know, ungodly words, you know, again, have the power to bind, imprison, and destroy. So let's just think of these. Creative words create. Destructive words destroy. Hurtful words crush you. Helpful words builds up. Toxic words poison. Soothing words healed. Faith-filled words bring life. And faithless words brings death. Wow. So what are the phrases when you reflect back and I want you to do that and I want you to take your journal and really reflect on these things like what are the phrases that are etched in your memory that have shaped your life? You know, I know just a couple for myself was, you know, being told that, you know, you'll never amount to anything. Um, one was, I wish, you know, my mom used to say, like, I wish I never had you. Um, you'll never change. You're just like so-and-so. Those are words that have been etched in my life that comes to, you know, the forefront when I think about how my life has over, you know, filled whatever. Um, and I'm grateful for the power of a relationship with Christ so that I know who and whose I am. So that doesn't beat me up and bring, continue to keep me down. Like I've healed through those processes, but those are the things that have been etched that have shaped my life because without those words, without that process, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. I wouldn't have the relationship that I have with God right now. So even though there were some hurtful times and there's some painful times and some unflattering times, I'm grateful because it's built a foundation of the, the relationship that I currently have with Christ right now. And so next, I want you to think back on the past few days of when you spoke to others. What did they hear? Not what did you say? What did they hear? So I can give a great example of just my frustration just um, early in this week. You know, they didn't hear, you know, the good and loving thing. They heard frustration. They heard doubt. They heard aggravation. Because even though my words were saying one thing, how they were being put, the force and the energy behind them was something completely different. So therefore, what they heard was something completely different than what I said. So I want you to reflect on these past few days and think about the words that you've spoken and think about what you said and then what intent was behind them. And the intent behind them is actually what the listener heard. You know, because think about it, you either aimed sharp pointed tip darts at their hearts or you injected them with life. God honoring, you know, God boosting shots. I'll be honest with you. I know I didn't. Some of the things this week I was, I was, you know, going for the jugular. But, you know, I'm just like, okay, Lord, you have to help me. And just a life tip. Sometimes you become frustrated in situations because you was disobedient to God at a point when he told you to do something and you decided to make the change and do it yourself. And personally, that is what I'm going through right now. Even though right now I'm working on the steps and doing the things that he told me to originally do three years ago, I didn't do it then. And so therefore, my frustration sometimes is, you know, things that are going on that I knew was going to happen. He showed me it was going to happen because I didn't move when he told me to move how he told me to move. I am now going through this tough patch. 
while I'm preparing and doing the things that he told me to do. Because he's like, well, if you took done what I told you to do, you wouldn't be frustrated. You wouldn't be disappointed. You wouldn't be, you know, just wanting to throw in the towel. And so sometimes we go through these aspects, but we can't take it out on the persons around us because of our disobedience, our own disobedience. We have to understand and recognize and know where that lies. You know, so when we think about the power of our lips and tongues, basically, when we think about the um earlier and we was talking about Aesop, he was correct. Our speech and the type of wisdom that govern our govern our lives displays the state of our heart. So I want you to really think about what does your tongue reveal about your heart? Are you increasingly maturing your speech or do you find your tongue a restless evil that you cannot control? Now, I can control it with God, but sometimes we have to think about do we want to? That's another thing we don't talk about. Sometimes we we know what not to do. We just do it because we want to. So. We think of Aesop's solution, it was to control our tongue. James has taught us that apart from Christ, such an exhortation is impossible. Redeemed speech and wisdom only comes from the work of God. Like, let us cast ourselves on the the mercy of God and pray that he will continue his work in overthrowing the demonic words that occasionally flow from our mouths. Allow him to just rest in you and reside in you and to know that you are all the things that he has purposed you to be. And that requires a complete surrender to him complete it doesn't mean part of you a little bit of you half of you it means all of you you have to submit to the unwavering unadulterated word of God because if you don't we are operating on worldly wisdom And if we're operating on worldly wisdom, we are operating in our default, which is demonic, evil, and divisive talk. That is our default. We have to get to godly wisdom. We have to get to where our words bring life. You know, there will be times where we would have to use our words to bring death, but not to the body of Christ. It'll be to the enemy. But we have to get control and allow God to control it so that we can build up the kingdom of God. And that we can do all the things that we need to do to honor him. So as we close out this evening, again, I want you to reflect. What are the phrases etched in your memory that have shaped your life? And think back through the past few days, even the past few weeks of when you spoke to others. And I want you to think about and reflect what you said and what you intended. And you'll be able to identify what they heard. And at any point in time when you reflect and you will, you will. If you don't, um, you shouldn't. But when you reflect and you are going to see the harm that your words and the intent has called, go for forgiveness, ask for redemption, repent, ask him and surrender yourself completely and totally so that you will get his glory, so that the other person can get his glory, so that we can continue to move and build the body of Christ. Because we are stronger together than anything divided or separated apart. We are so much stronger together. So again, be mindful. Be mindful of your words. 
As Proverbs 18.21 says, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. I want to thank you so much for listening to this evening's show on Moving Past You. Be sure to visit us on our Facebook page, Moving Past You, and to join the conversation to access our show notes and to get fantastic bonus content. Um, and if you like to listen on the go, you can definitely subscribe to us on iTunes and Spotify. You can just search for Moving Past You. Click on subscribe, click the notification bell, and you'll be always brought into when we put new shows out there. And I always want to leave you with this. I want you to always remember to be kind in your word, in your thought, and in your deed. Be blessed. Have a wonderful evening. And we will talk on next week. Have a great, great night. Good night.